take it away. Excellent. Um, uh, so wait, maybe we should start now that we're recording by framing the discussion. Yes. Like, please. We're talking about the uh, the idea that records and tuples, rather than being primitives, would be uh, objects, but objects without identity that are that are compared. You could think Mark framed it as they're compared shallowly for equality in the sense that at that particular level, they're compared uh, by what they contain. And then recursively, the comparison continues. So if it contains another record, it recurses down, but it's not necessarily deeply the same thing because you can opt out of using records and tuples and just use normal objects. So there, there's kind of two, two fundamental questions. We were talking about one of them. Do we still need box or can we just let you use objects wherever you want? The other fundamental question is, uh, do we want to, uh, is it okay to split up the notion of sort of what a primitive is in two like this, where a primitive is these two things. One thing is it has wrappers and the other, and the other thing is that it has value equality. And now we're saying these things have value equality, but they don't have wrappers. So this breaks with the way we've been discussing it for a long time. Uh, and it could break with some people's mental model. I wanted to explicitly discuss whether that was okay, uh, even though you didn't raise it as a, as a concern. Yeah, so let, let me give a little background on uh, the distinctions that we made in the e-language. Um, and uh, can everybody see my screen with the, with the graph, with the, um, uh, the uh, graph with the red and yeah, uh, the orange and the blue and the gray? Okay. So um, we had this uh, taxonomy of uh, restricted forms of objects. Um, and um, the word frozen here does not mean uh, what it means in JavaScript. Uh, the term frozen here uh, is uh, just shallowly immutable. So a frozen object could contain non-frozen objects. And then the qualifier deep on these various um, you know, the, the adjective deep prefix to things like deep frozen means that whatever the restriction is, uh, that restriction applies deeply. So a um, deeply frozen thing would be one that uh, transitively has no mutable state within it. And, um, and mutable state in the, in the, has no ability to, to, to cause or sense effects in it. Um, so uh, by this taxonomy uh, in CES, when we talk about uh, the primordials being transitively immutable, um, uh, we're talking about them being deeply frozen. Now, we had this further distinction of selfless, which was our probably too cute name for an object without its own object identity. Um, so an object that's selfless would, um, uh, would compare based on uh, comparing the components, doing a structural comparison. And once again, uh, an object could be shallowly selfless. Selfless, the arrows here are an implication. If it's selfless, then it's necessarily frozen. It doesn't make any sense to do a structural comparison if the things that you're, com if the things that you're comparing could be mutated on one and not the other. Uh, that would, if a structure comparison then would give you unstable answers. Um, the, uh, for, for every deep form, the deep form implies the shallow form in that if you're deeply frozen, you must be frozen. Um, and then um, pass by copy was a further restriction, once again in shallow and deep form, where uh, in order to be passed by copy, uh, this was, and passed by copy, as the name implies, had to do with uh, computing across um, uh, address spaces. Uh, but the issues that uh, Dan's raising about uh, membranes, uh, I think the pass by copy notion is also a good way to think about what happens with these things across membranes, uh, which is that rather than having a proxy on one side for the real thing on the other side, you just get a complete duplicate on the other side of the membrane, which can be independent, or you just share them as if, they, and they have the same semantics as if they're duplicated. The, the main constraint on a pass by copy, the semantic constraint is that um, uh, 
uh, a complete copy of it cannot be distinguished from the original. If you have the original and the copy, then uh, there's no way to distinguish that what you have as a copy rather than two references the same original. So in this regard, let's say a JavaScript string, which might be duplicated on the heap, is passed by copy because there's no way to tell in JavaScript that it's a copy of the string rather than the same string. So a lot of what we're trying to get at um, in this proposal is in this area of selfless and passed by copy. Um, uh, the, in order for something to be, to be passed by copy, uh, there were uh, two further, there was a further restriction besides being selfless, it had to be transparent, um, uh, meaning that it doesn't encapsulate anything. And I see that uh, Dan's proposal also uh, you know, uh, gets at some of those same constraints as well, which is the stuff that's being duplicated in order to be duplicated needed to not be hidden uh, so that a membrane layer or, or, or a marshalling layer um, uh, could reproduce it on the other side, could make the copy. Uh, and transparent and E broke up into open state and open source, meaning the, you know, the data values and the code, which uh, in Dan's world is uh, sort of the, the fields versus the class, or the fields versus what it inherits from, the proto pointer. Um, uh, or, or, and also, actually, the open source also has to do with is there behavior that comes along for the ride? And that opens a bunch of interesting questions. Um, and then if you had, if you know, for any of these things, if they were true transitively, you could test at the root of, of any such subtree, is this, it, you know, is this transitively stable in this way? You have a predicate for each of these restrictions, um, including the, the predicate for the deep form. So you can actually tell that the thing that you've got is um, is uh, transitively, you know, is, is transitively whatever. Oh right, um, Bradley brought up this these predicates is an important thing when we previously discussed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, uh, one of the nice uh, things for us in our world of um, of multiple you know, vats or workers sharing a, an address space and wanting to do, um, wanting to pass uh, structures when you're sharing an address space um, uh, is if something is deeply frozen, then it might also be thread safe. It will typically something which is deeply frozen is thread safe. So for, in, for so in E, um, uh, you could have uh, two VATs, two you know, essentially workers in JavaScript terminology, sharing an address space, and when you did a, um, a, a message pass between them, uh, the message pass would have the semantics of uh, the same semantics as doing a message pass between address spaces, except that when it saw that something was deeply frozen, it would just pass it by pointer sharing rather than passing it by copy. So you could do large, deep um, data sharing uh, uh, without, co without copying overhead if you happen to be in the same address space. Yeah, so the thing about uh, thread safety, that was something that I discussed with some JavaScript engine uh, maintainers. And they saw it kind of in contradiction with the optimizability of recursive equality which is an important feature of, of records and tuples because you need an intern table and just synchronizing the intern table across threads within the same process is, is prohibitively expensive. So it makes the reliable, cheap equality impossible. So nope. what I expect is that records and tuples would be copied across threads rather than, but, but actually the discussions made me very optimistic that we may actually get reliably fast equality. Okay. So, uh, so I, I love the hash counting idea. Uh, these ideas are not in conflict. Um, the uh, when you receive, so so there's two ways to approach it. One is to in turn on reception, 
where um, uh, you check, you, you walk, you, know, you on, on reception, you walk the structure and say for, for any substructure here, if I've already got it in my local interning table, I'm going to use that one. But otherwise, I don't need to make a copy. Otherwise, I can take the one that I've received and use that as the one I'm interning. So when you're sending new, new data that's not already on the other side, you still get to avoid the copy. And if it is on the other side, you still get to avoid the copy because you already have it on the other side. So in both cases, you get to avoid the copy. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Uh, I'll mention it to them. But the other thing is that some JavaScript just have a single threaded GC. And they, 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 they heap isolation by thread. Right, right, right. So each, thread, each thread has its own interning table. You can share the structure. Oh, oh I see. I'm sorry. GC. Um, right. If you're, if you're doing separate, if you're doing per thread GCs, then you have to copy. That's correct. So I think for records and doubles, we'll just coordinate expectations among JavaScript programmers that, like, for now, they use per thread GCs. Thanks for mentioning this technique for the intern table. I'll mention that to the implementers. And uh, we'll just have to, you know, but we'll, but we'll still try to coordinate expectations that look, if you do pass these to another thread, it's gonna be copied for now because that's what JS engines do with their per thread GC. They, the V8 team says that it has potentially security benefits to have per thread GC because it decreases sort of the surface area that you know, that the threads interact with each other. So, or, or integrity benefits, it's, you know, talking about what security means, you know. Um, anyway, you can keep going. Yeah, so I, I, th so I think that's, that's, a, that's a valid point. So that what this does is, it's like the, the stance we were taking on interning in the first place, which is, uh, we're not guaranteeing interning, uh, we're leaving it up to the implementation uh, but we're, we're creating a semantics that gives the implementation that choice. Uh, this would, we could simply take the same stance with regard to copy avoidance when you're passing between threads. Uh, right. We can take that with copy avoidance, but at the same time, I want to do a little bit of a stronger policy than that, because I do want to, I want to see if we can coordinate expectations somewhat, because it can be hard for engines to deal with the performance expectations of, of JavaScript programmers. And if we just publish guidance, not in the spec, but just on the side, then it could help people. Okay, uh, that, that guidance on the side seems fine. Uh, I, it, it would still be, I still think, I, I do think though that having the semantics be one that gives the option of that optimization um, acknowledging yes, the trade-offs is nice. Yeah. In any case, the main point here is not the optimization. The main point here is that it's a very, very clean uh, semantic model. Uh, and we're reproducing a lot of this uh, in, a, in a restricted form for JavaScript at Agoric um, that I'm going to now show off over here, which is um, we've got this. Um, uh, in the, when we do um, distributed JavaScript computing, where we're passing JavaScript objects um, uh, between VATs, uh, we uh, have this predicate called pass style of, uh, which is you know, named to be sort of seeming in a, in a sort of understandable analogy to type of, um, and it classifies the objects into um, uh, several different buckets according to how they should be passed between VATs. Um, so, I'm having trouble understanding this example. Yeah, hold on. I'm, I'm trying to get a bit. Wait a second. This is not. Oh, okay. 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 This file is not a terribly useful one to put on the screen. Let me just talk it through. 
Um, actually, this one's probably the, the more interesting one. So same structure is the um, uh, equality semantics of our distributed object system. Uh, and what it does is, is to, to ask same structure of a, a left, left and right, says, okay, get the, the path style of those two things. Um, uh, the, I'll, 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 let me come back to the promise case, because that one, uh, pr we're probably doing something that we don't want to reproduce in your proposal, uh, but it's an interesting question. Um, obviously, if their past styles are different, then the answer, same structure is false. If it's any of the primitives, then we just use the same value zero semantics. So in that, in that regard, we already arrived at the same place. Um, uh, we have copy record and copy array, uh, which is really very much like, uh, you know, very analogous to the record in tuple. Um, the, in order for something to be considered a copy record, um, uh, it's, um, uh, it had, well, we have a bunch of restrictions on it that are not necessarily the ones that we want to reproduce. But basically, it's inherits directly from um, object.prototype. Uh, all, for all these cases, they must be frozen. Uh, and, um, and the own properties are themselves passable things. Um, uh, and then we, um, And then if and then we have to then we go through and see that for all the names that the that the values of those names are recursively same structure. Uh, our test right now is not cycle tolerant. Uh, an interesting question is uh, whether uh, we want to allow uh, immutable shallowly immutable cycles. Um, uh, can um, uh, and uh, even if we don't allow cycles, do we allow DAGs? I think we probably don't want to allow cycles, but we do want to allow DAGs. And for DAGs, you'd like to um, have the cost of the comparison. Um, uh, I suppose that's already the interning table get uh, optimization already gets at that issue, so that's that's good. Okay. Um, So one thing that Nicolo and I were trying to work out was how should membranes work over records okay. and buttons? Good, good. So, um, uh, so the, the, your notion of the proxy record, or the record proxy, um, uh, uh, first of all, did you mean to, to restrict that to records or did you mean to also include uh, tuples? Uh, so the concept, the records and record proxies would be sort of kinds of records in this case. So, so, so rectuple should be sort of polyfillable in terms of record using a record proxy. I and I, one, I one question we came to was that the design there was completely broken because we need in addition to the handler, we need sort of a payload for the handler, which could be the this sent as the this value to the handler methods, because normally the handler would close over some something. And so we would need sort of a third argument to that. Right. So the, the, I think the notion of shallow equality is the thing that really uh, saves you here, which is um, uh, the, if you've got a, um, uh, I'm sorry, shallow, shallow selflessness or shallow, uh, you know, being shallowly immutable free. Uh, a proxy itself is already shallowly immutable. All of the state is only in the handler and the target. Um, the proxy, proxy does, does have, have identity. Each proxy. Yeah, proxy does have identity. 
but the idea of a proxy that is exactly the current proxy, except that uh, comparing it recursively does the same value zero comparison on its uh, handler and target. And then the handler and target could in turn be shallowly immutable things, in which case it just you just continue the recursion. Or if they're not, then the recursion stops because that's the leaves that then, then, the, then the target and the handler become the leaves of your shallow comparison. So I, 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 have, um, I have multiple conversations with Daniel this week about these. And I'm still confused um, about a few things around these. Um, and I also have some concerns that I express somehow. Um, specifically, the biggest concern that I have is that in most cases, you don't need to know that what you're receiving is a record or a tuple. You're receiving a thing that you interact with it in the same way that you interact with any object. And if you want to add a proxy around it, uh, if we do a special kind of proxy um, for records and tuples, then that means you have to do the extra work of being defensive about the objects that are being handed to you because you don't know if it's going to be one of these things. Um, especially you want some sort of a special behavior, but that's fine. Um, so, so, but, sorry, oops, sorry, pretty, I'm trying to understand the concern here. Is the you the membrane implementer or is the you the code on the other side of the membrane? Um, I would say the, the other side of the membrane. Okay, so what is, so let's say you're expecting a regular object and you received a, um, a, a record or you received a proxy, a selfless proxy whose target object was a record. Um, uh, 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 if you were right, if, if the code that received it was just express it, expecting a normal object, uh, what would be the hazard? Right, so I'm, I'm, about, I'm about to get to that. Let me, let me, let me complete the sentence. So um, based on, 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 on the assumption, my assumption is that we don't need a special type of proxy for this. And I'm trying to articulate why I, don't th I, I think so. So if you're, you're putting a proxy around a record um, and, and that record is an object that has no identity whatsoever, I describe it in the gist from, from Daniel. Um, the independently of what the handler is doing, if the target of the proxy is a, a, a record, um, you don't even need to check the handler to know what the output of that will be, because in order to keep the uh, the the invariance, the object invariance, the since the record has everything frozen, non-configurable, not writable, then right. so all the outputs of the handler should be consistent with the current record that you have. Right. That's so one thing to- We might have to make the record, uh, the record fields configurable and not, and make the record not sealed in order to get around that. What? Well, well uh, uh, what? before we get to that, like the, uh, I would like to first understand what, why they need to be configurable and so on, because we overcome these limitations by introducing the shadow target instead. And if you bring a shadow target into the picture, um, then I, I don't see a big problem there where you still have a shadow target, you still have a handler that is associated somehow to, a, to the record. And the, the trap there, so the, so the solution for the shadow target issue was that you would pass in a third argument to the- well, No, no, before, before, Daniel, before we get to that, before we, before we get to how we're going to solve the problem, I want to understand the problem first. So if the shadow target, which is normally the same type of the target. So if you're creating a, 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 a proxy, a membrane proxy of a function, the shadow target should be a function creating a regular object, then it should be an object. If it is an array, it should be an array because 
that help you with some of the tests that might happen against that proxy that needs to know what the type of the, of the target is. So if you're creating a shadow target that happens to be a record because you are creating a proxy around a record, then because it is a record, it's also frozen. So it becomes a little bit more tricky because but this you is a need to understanding because the record dot is record check would return true for all record proxies, regardless of what their target is, because they're, they're always shallowly immutable. The, okay. So the, when you say the record is record checked, uh, so in a world of shallow immutability, what are the guarantees that follow from the record is record check? Once I take an object, and, and I do a record is record on it, and the, and the answer is true, what do I now know that I did not know before? What guarantees do I have? So you know that whenever you use it in a context that requires identity, such as a weak map key, then it will, it will fail. And, you'd, okay. and you know that it, well, that it would be possible for someone who has the right building blocks to make something that would triple equals it without having that same identity. That's not really a guarantee, but that's sort of what it would mean. So the record that is record check would be used to determine whether to make a record proxy or a normal proxy when you're a membrane. I don't think there's anything that somebody on the other side of the, the membrane would have to do special for that. No, but, but my, my, the, the issue about what guarantees follow, I think is really sort of the core, um, the way I would approach uh, the question that Karuti is asking uh, is um, uh, if for a non-proxy, a non-record proxy, just a regular record, if, but in a world of shallow, um, you know, shallow selflessness rather than deep selflessness that we're not talking about, um, if I do a record is record check uh, and the answer is true uh, and I make some assumptions because the answer is true, uh, then I would want it to be the case that if I did it on a record proxy instead um, and the answer was still true, that the same guarantees would follow. I don't want the record proxy to break any guarantees that I would be assuming for a, reg for a normal record. Exactly. So if, if, if I create a, 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 that's, a, a thanks, uh, uh, Mark. So I think that's, that's, that's the gist of my question. Like, in my opinion, if you're going to create a proxy out of a record, uh, even if you're using the shadow target tricks, you still need to do a lot of work to produce a shadow target that actually guarantees the same things that will be guaranteed once you know that the actual target is a record. I think it's the same. And the only way I, I the only way I see these to work is that you have to actually at the membrane level you have to create a shadow target whose shape is consistent with the shape of the of the the thing that you are uh, uh, creating a proxy of the target. So you have pretty, to do a deep copy kind of thing in terms of, of proxies of all these records. So uh, pretty all that sounds correct to me, uh, but it's the same job. I mean, it's, I think it's pretty much the same job we're currently doing creating shadow targets right now. It's the same logic. No, no, because today the shadow target is empty. The shadow target you is empty unless that you- Shadow target for a frozen object. Uh, yeah, shadow target for frozen object uh, is, still possible so yeah I, I, uh, I would say that yes this is the same that we do today okay good i thought we would want to be able to do distortions over uh the box in a record or tuple would this be possible you could do you could do you could do distortions but but the shape of it because the the shadow target is a record the the shape of it has to be defined before you create the proxy Right, right. Just like for because it's a record. If you're if you're trying to if you want to if you if you're doing a proxy if you're doing a proxy for a frozen object and you want the distortion to provide to provide something that is still a frozen object a different frozen object, 
that's a perfectly fine distortion, uh, but you have to do the distortion up front if you're going to have the result be a frozen object. So are you, are you okay with records and tuples incurring that overhead when they pass over membranes? The, for the shallow ones, yeah. Uh, uh, so here's something interesting, which is uh, if we've got a predicate where we can in constant time and you know, in, ex in, in you know, developer expected constant time using your, your same notion of, uh, of advice rather than mandate. But if in, in developer expected constant time, you can check that this is a deeply selfless um, uh, structure a uh, deeply selfless structure should be able to just uh, pass through uh, the membrane as is if you don't care to distort it. And once again, that sort of goes back to uh, this diagram where um, it's only the deeply frozen things that can be passed between address spaces by pointer sharing. Uh, something that's shallowly frozen has to be duplicated because the things that are at the leaves have to be passed by other means. And, and going across the membrane, I think, I, th I think this, you know, more and more convinced me that, that going between address spaces or between threads or across membranes is very much, those three cases are really, um, you know, um, very equivalent in many ways. It's, it's only if you're, you know, deeply, um, identity of us that you can just go through the membrane uh, without without any copying overhead. I see. I see. So uh, then is the so I'm sorry for very sorry for interrupting you before Garrity. So it sounds like we should just make them be have the the property descriptors of frozen objects and not have them be sort of looser in some way because it's okay to do the copy. So if you, if you have a, if you have an object nested in a nested record in tuple, basically you have to copy the path to the object. You don't have to copy the whole nested structure, just the part that has the part that you need to do distortion over. Is that right? Is that uh, right? Say, say that again. I'm, not sure about it. I'm, 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 I'm still confused about how you have an object deep into a record. Uh, Are you talking about the box? Yeah, box. But no, no, I, I, box I, is a record. I'm not talking about box. I'm talking about getting rid of box. No, no. So, so, Kriti, I, I'm not sure if you if you were here at the beginning. Um, uh, what I'm suggesting is that we get rid of the box notion completely, and we just say that we're no longer talking about deep immutability. We're talking about, in general, uh, objects that are shallowly immutable and without identity, but where the leaves of the so basically talking about a um, a identityless superstructure where the same the identity of the superstructure is also immutable uh, but then the leaves of the superstructure are just regular objects they can be you know any other javascript value is when you reach something other than an identity leaf object then you're at the leaf of the identity identityless superstructure um, and um, uh, the things which are deeply identityless are the ones that um, don't have uh, any leaves that don't have, you know, in which, in which the only leaves are primitives. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, so that gets rid of the notion of box. Uh, does, that, does that also include underscore the scar proto? So, uh, um, so the, the, it is consistent with the shallow perspective that a identity, that two different identityless objects um, could share a, a normal object as their underbar underbar pro, as their under proto in just the same way they, sh they might share a normal object as the value of their foo property. So the, the Dunder Proto pointer itself would have to be a, um, uh, a fixed pointer uh, as, as you would expect on a, on a non-extensible object. So the object would be, you know, for, for an object to be identityless and shallowly immutable, uh, it would have to be, um, you know, all of its properties would have to be non-configurable, non-writable, 
uh, and it's the object as a whole would have to be non-extensible, but uh, and therefore which object it inherits from is fixed, but that object could be a regular object just like the value of the property, of any property could be a regular well, we, we talked about this last week and my concern there was that then if I do a check on a record, I, I do, is this a record? And he says, yes, it is a record. And I do record.x twice, I might get a different value. So, okay, so, that, so then, so that becomes a question, uh, goes back to the question of what are the guarantees that we want to follow from right, the text? Right, right, right. And uh, if we want, so, uh, so the, the, the straightforward notion of record that I was just stating, I would say that you're only guaranteed equivalence of, of own properties, um, or sorry, you're only guaranteed stability of own properties, that inherited properties, um, you'd still be inheriting them from the same object, but, what, but, but that object could be mutated. Um, uh, we, the, uh, if, the, if we had a predicate for uh, is deeply immutable, uh, then everything at all levels that you reach from the object would have to be stable. Uh, I could imagine that, we, that for JavaScript, you know, the, the inheritance issue is, is, arises that was not an issue for E. Uh, I could imagine that we had something that was uh, defined as um, another predicate for just transitively up the prototype chain, but not transitively across properties. Um, so that, uh, and then that would apply to, to, uh, to all properties on the object, whether owned or inherited, but would still not apply to things reached by navigation from those properties. You know, it would apply to dot foo, but it would still not apply to dot foo dot bar. And then if it was really transitive, then it applies not just to dot foo, but it applies to dot foo dot bar. So basically, there's three levels of guaranteed stability. Just own, own and inherited, and own, inherited, and navigated. So there, um, that's, I mean, I, I have to think more about this, but in principle, I think my biggest issue is going to be for developers, because there are certain expectation and, and using own properties only as the thing that you can trust. So it might be that the that if we had all three of those predicates, that the one we would that um, the one that's own only is one that we would um, uh, consider to be the more obscure predicate. And the ones that we promote from normal use are the ones that are transitive up the prototype chain and the ones that are that are completely transitive um, through all navigation. I, I think we have to be really careful about the set of predicates that we expose, because I think if we expose like all of these, it's going to be unintelligible. We have to, you know, I don't know whether the, I mean, I see the, I see the, the argument for exposing both shallow and deep ones and promoting people to use the deep ones, but it, I feel like there's some risk to it. Okay, so let's let's explore the possibility that I think is what Kurt is getting at, which is that the shallow immutability is still transitive up the prototype chain. That if you're if you're frozen, if you're not frozen, if you're um, immutable, if you're if you're identity free, then necessarily you're under proto is identity free and 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 therefore recursively up the prototype chain from yeah. there. Note, note that tuples don't meet this property and we decided that it was very important that tuples do have a mutable prototype because if we do want to add methods to it the other another case is temporal if we wanted temporal to be modeled by something identity -less, which i think would be useful uh this would prohibit monkey patching on temporal which for this, which we would probably want to be able to do for the same reason as we want to be able to do it for, uh, for um, you know, for tuples. I I also want to mention this 
open open state property if we wanted to model temporal as something open as something passed by copy temporal has internal slots and those internal slots uh they're not they're they're not transparent and so they uh i think they're still meaningful and uh there's still a meaningful sense of selflessness but it's not transparent and i and i kind of feel like the core of records and tuples is is selflessness in this so so you that, that is a, a you know, as you see on on my diagram um, uh, pass by copy is a stronger constraint than selfless, and you can have selfless objects that are not transparent, but those things don't pass by copy. Um, uh, in order to pass by copy, you have to have, you have to be transparent so that the so that um, some intermediate layer can access everything it needs to copy. Um, uh, the I, if we're going to collapse distinctions, which for JavaScript I think makes perfect sense. Uh, then I think, uh, you know, then, then we have to, to choose what distinctions we're collapsing, but I think that you can't, um, I noticed in your proposal, and I liked in your proposal, that the things which are immutable don't have hidden state, uh, even hidden immutable state. And, um, and, and the fact that, uh, and, you know, that you can't add the state with return override, uh, the fact that return override can be modeled with these maps is consistent stance in your proposal because you also can't use these things as keys in these maps. Um, yeah, that, that's true, but I would like to be able to expand uh, to having private fields in records and tuples. Like if we made it so that you could use private fields in object literals, uh, which I have a, a gist for if anybody's curious, then, uh, then I would want to be able to use those in records also. But do you think that that's a bad idea because it would not be transparent? So the uh, in E, although we had the option, as you can see on the table, things that were selfless that were not passed by copy, in practice we never made use of that. Uh, likewise, in our distributed object system, um, you can create something that looks to the com system like passed by copy, uh, but which actually does have other encapsulated state. It does these objects being in JavaScript right now normal JavaScript have object identity, so you can associate private state with them through weak maps. But in practice, what we do is we, we sort of bifurcate the world to objects that are just acting like structured data, um, uh, which are um, in very much the same way that, that you pass you know, JSON data around, and you just think of them as data. You don't think of them as engaged in procedural abstraction, engaged in object abstraction. And then you've got objects with methods that encapsulate state um, that have identity. And pretty much, you know, having given ourselves an E, this very fine taxonomy, what we ended up using is just the bifurcation that you've got uh, 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 immutable, transparent, identity-free data, and you've got uh, objects with methods and identity. Uh, and, and I think that's the sweet spot. So I, I think, I mean, records and temples definitely operate to the intersection between this, because they're not, they don't allow any hidden state. But I would like to think about feature extensions where we are using hidden state. I mean, record proxies, there's no way to get at the at the target directly, but maybe if we say that there's no uh, payload, there's just no way for them to hold anything sort of significant. And if they're if the target's already frozen, uh, for um, but then if we think about things like temporal or even decimal, if you wanted decimal to be this kind of selfless object, because it solves the wrapper, it could solve the wrapper identity issue because you just say the prototype is pointed to by the decimal value. So we don't need to maintain another map off the side from brands to prototypes that could be maintained by lexical scope and we could make it work, but it could be kind of inefficient to, to have to go through that extra mapping. Okay, I think that, I think, uh, let me, let me uh, clear up something that I think is important here, which is uh, in the, 
um, records and tuples and um, uh, the value test proposal that we built on them, um, the mutable prototype behavior uh, was the reason it was not a conflict for those things to be mutable, for the prototype that provided behavior to be mutable, is that the value did not bind the prototype. Uh, it was um, uh, on dereferencing the value, just like with strings. When you do string dot right. foo, you're looking up foo from a string prototype, which is mutable, but which string prototype is not determined by the string, is determined by the code doing the dereferencing. And then you had the brilliant insight that you could um, uh, make value types with behavior possible by going fully lexical on that notion of binding between the value uh, and the code that it inherits from. Um, right, so as I've chatted with more people about that fully lexical idea, I get the feeling that uh, it would be kind of implementation hostile because you need both the brand in the object, I mean in the value, not in the object, and you also need the, uh, this lexical mapping, which is somehow efficiently maintained code that compiles against this has to account for the fact that you may run it multiple times with different, um, you know, you may run the same source location multiple times with different, uh, you know, uh, translation tables in scope. So it's hard to consistently. Sure, if, it's, if it's the same, um, when you say the same code, are you talking about the, the, the same source code having been Evaluated multiple times, or you're talking about the same evaluation of the same, same source code executed. Same source location. You could have, uh, you know, you can use this locally in a function based on arguments to the function. So multiple invocations of the same function could have different mappings for how the two object of a value type works. So uh, Ultimately, I'm, I'm a little bit worried that this could be too expensive and that it could be better for, to, for us to use selfless objects that actually point directly to their prototype okay. so, uh, in order to get to things like decimal. So, so we definitely have a, um, you know, attention here. Uh, given that we're starting with, by giving up on uh, saying that the, you know, by, if we're starting with giving up on the notion that that the only notion of, of selfless mutability we have is the deep one, we're giving up that, that and we're, we're allowing shallow, uh, then the question is what kind of shallow topologies, what kind of, topolo what kind of boundary between the identity-free immutable world uh, and the leads are we allowing? And if a identity-free object can have an, an identity full, um, uh, uh, Dunder Proto, then we lose the dot foo guarantee that Crudy was, uh, you know, was wanting. But we do have, yes, but, that's but true. we have the. So it's just it's it's you know we have those options, but it's a tension. We can't make the tension go away. We have to make some choices. Yeah, yeah, I I agree completely with that analysis. Do you think it, it? Do you think we understand this space well enough to potentially go ahead with records and tuples while leaving this tension sort of in play to be determined by the no. speaking to I think, the I think I think I think the records and tuple proposal that's on the table uh, we we would want to withdraw if we're going in this direction because those records and tuples are not objects they're primitive values and we we and I think that. The language should not have both. If we're going to pursue uh, shallowly immutable identity free objects, then we should kill the current records and tuples as primitive values. Well, I mean, yeah, that, that would be the idea. They would not be primitive values. This is a proposed change to the records and tuples proposal. I still feel like we can use the brand names record and tuple oh. for okay. this and the syntax and all the, all the, we did a lot of design work about like the definition for equality the standard okay. library for tuples, all that carries over. Actually, okay. like very little user code that would change. The only, the only normal path that users would get to whether it's a primitive or an object is when they do type out. 
So that leads to the obvious question of should identity list objects have a different type of? So um, uh, uh, I think not. Um, uh, I would recommend that um, that the type of them is still just the string object because there's a tremendous amount of code up th out there that says uh, if it's not type of object or type of function, then it must be a primitive value. So there's, you know, there's only two type of values that are not primitive. Uh, and I think there's a lot of code out there that makes use of that. Um, uh, the, but but there, the, the deeper issue here is that the current records proposal has this binding on use to a prototype. And that is incompatible with the notion of a shallowly immutable object binding its prototype. Whether the prototype is selfish or selfless, um, uh, it, it would still be the case that it's the object that carries the prototype. The prototype is not determined at the point of use. And that's a huge difference, difference from the current records and top of the proposal. Can I step in for a second about the compromise and why uh, tuples have a mutable prototype? Um, so to my knowledge, nobody disagrees with uh, shallowly immutable prototypes uh, in this call. Uh, I think we're all agreed the ability to have guaranteed property access is nice and things of that nature. Um, for tuples, they have a different set of integrity guarantees than records. For records, we've talked about string keys in particular being what integrity is guaranteed. For tuples, unlike uh, arbitrary string keys, we only have a subset of that. We have the subset being uh, these index properties, okay. which we are not desiring people to be able to uh, put index properties on the prototype of a tuple. So we maintain the integrity of index properties, even if the tuple prototype is mutable. Right. Um, Based on it being an integer indexed exotic object. Yes, which I believe we simply must do. Um, so although the tuple is an exceptional special case, that it does eventually get to a um, mutable prototype. I don't think we need it to be more than a special case. And I am not keen on special casing uh, tuples to always inherit from a mutable prototype, but I don't necessarily think it's fatal because we still maintain our integrity about uh, what you can do with guarantees that we're trying to achieve for a tuple. So there, there's, I mean, there's still the tension where the old tuple, uh, it, it, the tuple itself did not bind in, bind in the prototype. The prototype was bound at the point of use. Um, uh, the new tuples that we're talking about would necessarily bind in um, uh, the, the, the prototype, the object they inherit from. Uh, and uh, then we've got, then we have to circle around to uh, you know, Karidi's question, which is uh, in order to be shallowly mutable, do you have to be shallowly mutable up the prototype chain? Because if, um, you know, if tuple T were shallowly mutable and I had a, uh, you know, is, you know, is, a, you know, is uh, one of these identity free things and the answer is yes, then even though I would have integrity for T sub three, if I don't have integrity for T dot foo, then I don't have, you know, then, then shallow immutability is still not giving me integrity for dot foo. So we still but have- this is, um, I think I may be misunderstanding something because this level of call site uh, usage guarantee of integrity is not true for any of the like primitive types we currently use. 
that produce object wrappers. Right, but, but the thing is the primitive value doesn't bind in the prototype. The prototype is, is determined at the point of use. And that's also true for the current tuples in the, in the before we, we make them objects. Uh, and that's fine because it's not, uh, it's not part of the value, it's determined at the point of use. So if you pass it to a different context, then the other context would look up a different prototype because the, the value doesn't carry its prototype with it. So I, I want to um, emphasize, I do, I do value this sense of integrity that Bradley mentioned, and I want to figure out how we can square it with potential other types that, uh, things that we might want to make identity list. So the, the core issue I think is integrity for the things in the domain. So the domain of, of tuples being numbers, the domain of records being strings. And so we have a PR out that we haven't decided whether to land or, or not, which says that um, records actually do have a prototype, but only symbol property keys are forwarded up to the prototype. And so I'm just thinking about how we could generalize this if we want to make value classes or, or record classes maybe more accurately if they're selfless objects. And I think it could be something like the record classes would have fields and those fields would be the domain that we guarantee the, uh, the integrity over. And if you type something, it's not a field name. So if you, if you do a property access that's a field name, it would go to that, uh, you know, to get that field of the of the record. And if you type something that's not a field name, it would be able to go up to the prototype. So that could explain how temporal would be sort of okay to be a, a record because it, it doesn't have anything in its domain over things that are, you know, field property accesses. So I didn't understand that about temporal. It would still be the case that the uh, shallow object um, uh, you know, the, the actual instance uh, is transparent and the fact that it could So inherit, for temporal, um, it would not be transparent. It would be selfless, but based on private fields that actually store the, the contents and those private fields would be what's compared by the, by the comparison. Okay, so I, really, I really don't like the idea that the selfless object itself has private fields. Could you, so how do you think you, I mean, what do you think about decimal in this model? Decimal, you don't want, you want to have a representation that's not the same way as it's being exposed. Because that's, decimal has been at the back of my mind for, for all this design work with records and yeah, uh, uh, as, as it should be. Um, so if, co if, if a membrane came across a decimal instance uh, where the membrane did not already have knowledge of decimal specifically, uh, but seeing that it was transitively immutable as, as decimals normally would be, I would hope, uh, it wanted to just make a copy. Uh, how could it make a copy without knowing, without having prior knowledge of the decimal logic? Uh, I don't, so I'm, I don't really understand this make a copy. Oh, because you need to make a copy for the, for the, uh, target of the proxy to do the frozen object. So, so, um, let's take, let's, take, let's take the case where you're passing it between address spaces. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have a solution for passing it between address spaces. I was assuming that that would be out of scope for this. That you would have to do some other kind of serialization thing. You would so, have okay. to. So the serialization thing is what I'm talking about. So so you you write a serialization layer that like we've done like like you know like like uh, like you know this code over here this Marshall thing is essentially a serialization layer that classifies things as pass by copy or not, and then the pass by copy superstructure it passes by serializing on one side and unserializing on the other side. Um, uh, the I guess I feel like if you if you're, are using something with private fields, like temporal or decimal, uh, you really want to be able to have your internal representation, which is already parsed, and then you want to have a serialization, which is explicitly designed. 
and which is, you know, uh, perfect bijection and like it's a good representation of what it's doing, but that it's not, uh, not necessarily the same as the representation in memory. Okay, so where does, the, okay, so, so the serialization, how does, how do, when you create a decimal type, how does the author of the decimal type um, uh, say how it serializes? Well, you could have a method like symbol.serialize on decimal prototype, or we could say that two string forms this method, but two string is way too messy probably for this. You would have, it would just be an explicit thing. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, just wouldn't be based on the, the properties because when you're using private fields, you, you want to be able to evolve that and have that not affect the serialization format. So there, I mean, there's, there's the issue of uh, evolving the format uh, to make different implementation trade-offs but have the same semantics. And then there's evolving the format to express different semantics. Yeah, uh, so I think the first one is really important. I mean, there are cases when you want to do the second one, but I want to assume that you can figure out one serialization format, which I think is true for, for both temporal and decimal. Okay. And but then you want to iterate on the implementation details. Okay. For example, so we, we, maybe decimal will sometimes be optimized as an IEEE decimal when it's like in range and otherwise be a variable length one. And that, that kind of thing would be kind of messy in memory. You wouldn't want to serialize that directly. You would want to convert it to a string. And there's a, there's a unique, you know, string representation for decimals. So would you accept the following equivalence that the, um, that all of the information um, must be available um, in a stereotype way through external interfaces, such as property access or asking for a serialization. Uh, if two objects are identical, they must have the same serialization. Uh, and that therefore, um, the, any other hidden representation is just an optimization of the visible representation, uh, because you can always recover it from the visible rep representation. Oh, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that would, that would work for, for decimal. For temporal, temporal has, has further issues where it supports these custom calendars that are just not serializable at all. But if you use temporal without a custom calendar, then it should, it should be, serializable in that in that strict sense of you know the the serialized thing could be what you're comparing for for equality so we could so we could say that if you're writing one of these in javascript you must provide the serialization as a public record field but then you can have private record fields that are calculated as a function of this but then if you have a native implementation of it it's allowed to sort of optimize that away as long as it provides observably equivalent behavior. Is this sort of what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I didn't think about it that way. Uh, do the record and tuple champions, um, how do they feel about this correction? Uh, they're, they're interested in thinking about it. Like, they're not ready to conclude that this is the direction yet. But, you know, Nicolo and I are working closely with them. Or maybe Nicolo is a, is a champion. Uh, and the question, one question that was raised by, by Robin is, is it reasonable to split up the, which I guess you're saying yes, the notion of primitive versus object, where object, where primitives are deep passed by copy and objects are, uh, you know, nothing. They're, they're self, they're, they're not represented in this, this diagram because they have all the, all the stuff. Um, you know, we're, we're choosing a point in between, but is that too messy that now JavaScript would have uh, three types of values, primitives, objects, and this point in between. Yeah, yeah, that was actually why I had never, you know, even coming from E and doing this distributed object system at Agoric, 
why I have never proposed this is it is a third concept. Um, and the records and tuples before this concept uh, uh, fit nicely into the existing concept of a primitive value, but only if it's transitive. Once it's not transitive, then having it be thought of as a primitive value no longer makes sense. I see. Uh... In, in E, we had just two concepts because we didn't have primitive values. All, all values were objects and they were either selfless or, selfless or selfish, but they were both objects. Numbers were objects. Yeah, that sounds a lot cleaner in some ways. So uh, for the proxy, for the record proxies, did it turn out that we don't need a separate, uh, you know, payload that as long as you're doing the right sort of copying when constructing the shadow target, it should be enough? Uh, I think so, yeah. And now there's a interesting question, which is, um, but it's already the case that if your shadow, if you just use new proxy or, uh, and your target is an array, that array dot is array on the proxy will succeed. If you just do new proxy and your target is a function, then you've created a function proxy that will also trap on apply and construct. So one possibility is that we don't introduce a new array, a new proxy static method we simply extend the taxonomy to say that if your target is a record or tuple, then your proxy is a record or tuple proxy. Oh, that, that sounds clean. That makes a lot of sense to me. Because we wouldn't want to allow people to make proxy records over things that are not records or tuples anyway. Yep or vice versa. So uh, if we need to copy the record on tuple in a way in order to build a shell target, do we need to allow uh, creating proxies of the records or can we just uh, return a new record containing proxies uh, instead of the original properties? Oh, uh, I think you're right. Um, just like, uh, well, no, I don't know. Um, hmm. okay, let, me, let me make sure I understood the question. Um, so you've, so you've passed a, so a, a shallow record is being passed through a membrane. Um, the membrane, uh, goes through whatever its distortion logic is to create a another record, which is the shadow target for the original record, having created it, uh, does it gain anything by wrapping it in a proxy, or could it just release the shadow target as the representative on the other side of the member? Yes, that's my question. Yeah. That's a really good question. And I guess if it's okay to do that, then records and tuples could be primitives again, maybe. It would be primitives that membranes are expected to do that to. Um, so the notion of a primitive that contains a mutable object still really disturbs me. Uh, a notion of a selfless object that contains a mutable object does not disturb me. Uh, disturb me, I grant, is a weak argument. Um, but um, it, was, it was the shift of thinking of these things as, as identity-free objects that made me comfortable with them having mutable leads. And the shadow target, and, and letting the shadow target be the representative 
since it's since we're already going through all of the shadow target construction logic is consistent with the mutable leaves because all the leaves would still be on that other side of the membrane. Uh, well, I don't think we have to conclude on this today, uh, but more to think about. Another question, another thing I wanted to raise is that we heard concern from, uh, you know, the excess folks from, from Peter, uh, who is, you know, they're big users of, of CES or CES-like system, and they say that they already get a lot of benefit out of frozen objects in JavaScript. And uh, maybe we could do something that more closely relates to frozen objects in JavaScript than making up a new thing. Um, yeah. I've been trying to understand what that would mean. And I, so that was part of what led to this idea of, you know, that plus the demand for, for box led to this idea of these identityless objects. But um, so, so, so I think that you know, going back to the um, to this diagram over here, uh, deep frozen does not imply selfless, and deep frozen in this diagram really meant transitively immutable, like we're making the um, the primordials in CES. Um, the ROMability that XS uh, makes such good use of uh, is all about being transitively immutable. I don't think that that XS derives any additional benefit from being identity free. Uh, uh, it's also the case that I don't think identity free creates a problem. Uh, but I just I just want to make sure that we're distinguishing immutability, uh, you know, for purposes of ROMability um, uh, versus being identity free. Uh, right. So that. That seems consistent with their statement and it makes sense to me too, but I'm just wondering where we should go from here with records and tuples because uh, I'd like to be able to have something that doesn't add too much complexity for everybody and presents some kind of benefit. You know, if this is a huge amount of work for them to implement and it doesn't help their users um, and it's part of the JavaScript standard, what should we, how should we, how should we analyze this situation? Okay. Um, a thought there. Uh, you're talking about the uh, ROM ability, um, actually being able to have an immutable object that references immutable object, um, where the immutable part is in ROM and it points into uh, mutable memory is actually a a, a, a useful thing, and I, I think it's a it's a use case they rely on. Uh, it's interesting. Wait, but um, how does that use case come to be constructed? Uh, I'm not sure, but but the the, the sort of the box idea that that you know uh, in, in in Dan's proposal here kind of touches on that. Um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, they recognize I'm things that are frozen that are not frozen. One concrete problem that it solves is that read-only collections are currently proposed to be objects. So box would let you point from a record or tuple to a read-only collection. Uh, so, could, I mean, so I'm, glad, I'm, glad, I'm glad you raised read-only collections here because that's been kicking around in my mind since I read your proposal. Uh, I, what I would do with the, with the, uh, you know, the, the snapshot operation, the, read you know, the, the, the collection, the stable collections, uh, which we need a better term for, they're currently called fixed, um, uh, is uh, given your proposal, I would say that those are shallowly. Um, in fact, this is what e did, e did: is the snapshot, the snapshot diverge and read-only view operations are actually uh, what I did in E. And in E, I had let's just take the, the tuple case. Uh, I called them lists. I had flex lists, which are uh, have identity and are uh, mutable. Uh, the actual contents of the collection can change. I had const list, which was shallowly immutable and shallowly identity-free. Two const lists compared only on content. 
Uh, and then I had a read-only view, which uh, had identity. Uh, you could observe mutation, um, uh, but you could not cause shallow mutation through the read-only view. Um, meaning that if you had a read-only view of a flex list, then if the underlying flex list changed, you could see it, but you couldn't cause such changes. Um, it did not occur to me uh, that whether it makes sense to say that a read-only view might be selfless and compare based on what flex list it's a read-only view of. That's an interesting notion. In any case, main yeah, reason I'm moving I would be really interested in, in read-only collections going in that direction. Yeah. I mean, it would it would probably add some implementation complexity to add a a path to interning those read only collections, but I think it would have real user benefit. I mean, people asked, people mentioned on Twitter that they would really want to have, you know, uh, maps as record keys. Or one person did. I didn't really understand his use case completely, but uh, you know, there's maps are maps are ordered so. It, Right. Comparison wouldn't work very well for them. We might, we might want to make some kind of, well, I don't even know how you would make an unordered map because you can't sort the entries, but um, yeah. you could make so the sort order unobservable maybe. Yeah, so, so I'm going to, um, so let me explain what um, uh, doing for equality in the Agoric distributed object system, uh, which is um, I'm introducing a, um, a less precise equivalence class, um, uh, which is the same structure. Uh, and I'm introducing a collection that is indexed according to the less precise equivalence class. So uh, you know, just like the current map and set in JavaScript is indexed with an equivalence class that's not our most precise one. It's indexed by same value zero rather than being indexed by object is. Uh, you can, if you have a well-defined equivalence class that's less precise, that, that holds more objects to be in the you know, to be equivalent to each other, even though um, they're not the same object, uh, um, uh, then you could use objects which are visibly different in ways that, the, that this new equivalence class doesn't care about. You could still use them as indexes into those collections usefully. Um, uh, so in particular, uh, same structure, you give it two pass by copy maps that enumerate in different orders, um, the passable collection will consider them to be equivalent for purposes of index lookup. Uh, yeah, so we have these multiple notions of equality with triple equals versus same value. And so maybe we could make that kind of allowance. Yeah, we, you would need to introduce. I don't. I don't want to. Um, neither triple equals nor um, same value is one that I would want uh, to make any less precise. Um, uh, it's actually same value made conceivably. That's interesting. That's interesting. Same value is definitely one that I don't want to make any less precise. Same value zero. Wow, that's really bizarre. Let's okay. Here's a hypothesis. Let's explore this. Let's do a sanity check on it. Can we can we see if we could bring the uh, XS people into the conversation with us about records and tuples? Because sure, you know we're having an email thread but with you know me and Nicolo and the champion group and them, and uh, I kind of feel like we're talking past each other. And I feel like your your analysis could really help us understand things. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yes. Uh, Modable folk would be wonderful to have in this conversation. Um, uh, 
the, the, let me tell you, the, the scheduling constraint on the model folk is Peter's here in Palo Alto. Um, so he's, um, you know, um, uh, you know, meetable during the same times that most of the rest of us are. Uh, Patrick um, uh, is, I think, in France, but definitely in Europe. Uh, so uh, when we've met with both of them, we've generally had meetings at eight o'clock in the morning Pacific time. Um, uh, we could certainly do that. I'd certainly be interested in doing that. That would work better for me too, most of the time. I mean, right now I'm in New York, but uh, usually I'm in, I'm in Europe also. Okay. Yeah, adopting a, a, a Europe-friendly um, uh, time zone for a lot, I mean, it was a Europe-friendly time slot uh, for a lot of these meetings, I think makes a lot of sense. So this was, this was a lot of really productive discussion about records and tuples. I wonder if there's more to discuss about this or I also suggested decorators for the agenda. I'm sorry, you said what was the last sentence? Decorators. Oh, uh, I did not look at the decorator thing at all. So if you're uh, happy to start cold, um, uh, go for yeah, it. I, I would be happy to walk the group through it. Okay. And there's, there's a lot of people here whose, whose opinion I would be happy to have about this new decorator proposal. So, uh, I mean, you know, everybody. So, so yeah, Chip linked to it. I guess I should screen share so that I can point out to different, oh no, Chip linked to a different one. Okay. Let me link I'll, to it. I'll, I'll take down my screen share. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's called decorators and annotations. So oh, you still don't see the screen. Oh, uh, I didn't say. <laughs> didn't share it. Do you see it now? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. So decorators and annotations. So there's two things. There's decorators, which is the at, and there's also annotations, which are with sort of an object literal after the at. Okay. And the core concept is that decorators wrap a, um, a class element and annotations, uh, they put some metadata on it. When you wrap a piece of storage, like a field, it becomes a getter setter pair for accessing that storage. And that's useful for observation. But if you just annotate a field, it just adds the metadata. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't wrap it in that way. So some examples, this logged example, when you declare a method or a setter logged, then it should write some nice message. And that works by, it takes a function as an argument and it outputs a new function that does the right wrapping. So that's, that's kind of what you would want decorators to do, right? It's all simple. And so basically- Dan, Dan go, go back up. I need you to stare at that, stare at that code a little bit longer. The logged code or yeah, the, the code not used? Okay. Yeah, the log. Okay. Oh, there's a typo. It says f.name, but it's called fn. Anyway. Uh, um, so you probably want the wrapped to return the result of f.call. Uh, that too. That would be a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so. Um, I have these things in terms of desugarings. So these desugarings are kind of rough, but the idea is you could decorate public and private things. So there's the decorator gets past this, this function, but it doesn't get past the class. So although this desugaring is phrased in terms of mutations, it can actually be thought of as running while the class declaration is, is executing. All right, good. So, so if, if during that execution, um, uh, it, it does happen to have access to the class and it looks for the binding. It won't, won't see a binding because you're not mutating the binding, you're calculating the initial. There's just like lexically no way to get at the class. Like if you passed a reference to the class as a decorator argument, it would be TDZ, just like oh. for computed property keys. 
Got it. Okay. So then for, you know, you could have a class decorator, which decorates the class and that, uh, you know, similarly just sort of wraps the class in a function. And you can use this pattern of, um, you know, this sort of currying pattern to make like a decorator factory so the decorators can take arguments. So I thought that the whole notion of decorators as functions that run at runtime uh, was the thing that people were objecting to on initialization time overhead grounds. The thing that people were objecting to was, I think, decorators being dynamic in their effect on class shape. So all the previous decorators proposals, it depended which decorator was running. Different decorators would change the class shape in different ways. In this proposal, the class shape is changed in the exact same way each time. Uh, but further, if you just have something to do with metadata, there should be a declarative way to do it. That's another sort of invariant that was raised. And annotations do that. They, you know, of course, they evaluate the object literal. This is a full-fledged object literal in here. But uh, then they just add it to the class. They don't run any extra functions. So this could be a more a more declarative way that would be more friendly to code generation when people use the feature. Okay, so let me make sure I understand the, the previous point. Uh, the, there was an overhead issue they were concerned about, but it was not the fact that the decorators have to be executed at initialized time. Uh, it's the fact that because they change the shape, they preclude optimizations that engines would like to do before the decorators run based on looking at the code at the at the at the declared class level. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. For example, one optimization is generating a boilerplate for a class that would be sort of this optimized, partially evaluated uh, you know, template for making the constructor itself the, the thing about this boilerplate optimization is it's also broken by computed property keys, but the hope is that we sort of don't make it any worse. You can still apply sort of in practice, quote unquote, much of the time. So that that's one of the pieces of motivation here. So all the engines, they, they only do compilation through a JIT. And I don't understand why before decorator execution, is a better time to do their jitting than after decorator execution. Oh, the reason is because uh, you have to do some initial execution of the code. The, it turns out the interpreter performance is really key to making JavaScript fast in real life. So like five or 10 years ago, everybody was optimistic about these super advanced jits, making all these optimistic assumptions being the key to performance. But what it turned out was a lot of these fancy optimizations just didn't provide net performance win. You have to run the code a number of times for the optimizations to pay for themselves. That's why people make these multi-tier optimizing compilers, but also most JavaScript code just runs, just runs once. So when you have a class definition, okay. the class declaration is probably going to just run once and it won't benefit from any of those optimizations. It, it's better to use a very low tier, uh, you know, very baseline interpreter. But then if you have a large volume of that code, it can still hurt performance if the representation becomes very kind of complicated. Okay, okay, great. Okay, if, you, if you find any of this unpersuasive, I want you to keep, you know, asking questions. So uh, the other thing is that decorators can add annotations. So decorators are actually passed with two arguments. One argument is the thing they're wrapping and the other argument is the context object, which provides more information that I'll show examples of using it below. Uh, maybe it's an ugly API, but each, each decorator gets passed a fresh context object. And if you add on an annotations object to that, then that gets ultimately added to the annotations for the um, for the class element. So that this is something that would be fine to bike shed about because mutating is, is ugly, but at the same time, it's nice that the return value, the decorator is just simply the new thing that is the result of wrapping. 
I think that's a common case. Okay, the, the line that's currently at the top of the screen, um, uh, now it's more in the middle of the screen, uh, C open square bracket symbol dot annotations close square bracket dot prototype dot methods dot method dot A? Uh, yeah, so this is also a great thing to bike shed about, but uh, there would be some object, so there was this reflect metadata proposal by Ron Buckton that had a, um, a whole bunch of methods for metadata that was held in internal slots. I think we should be able to come up with something that's just objects and arrays with properties where we store the metadata. And I don't know how to address this. This is something that, that definitely needs more iteration. Okay, yeah, I mean, the context is a new concept that's being produced here. I don't know. Uh, yeah, so the context, I'll, I'll get into more examples of the context below. Well, for example, here the context passed includes the kind, like which syntactic element from you know a fixed list, the name or the property key, and whether it's static. And then you're allowed to mutate that to add on the symbol annotations, which is maybe a little messy and we could iterate on that kind of detail about the calling conventions. Okay. But, yeah, I would uh, say don't, don't use a symbol or an internal slot, just use a string named uh, property. Uh, but that might conflict with some existing thing. I don't know. I mean, it's on the new context object, so I don't see how- No, 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 but then it also gets placed on the actual constructor. So C is a class. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. I thought you were indexing into the context. No, you are indexing. No, no, so I was just punning it. I was saying you use the same API for adding to the context object as you use to look it up in the class. Okay, I was assuming that you were just adding this to the context object. Oh, no, 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 that's, yeah. So this on the last line is, look, is a lookup. This is a definition. And then it, it filters out into a lookup and I should have another line here that says like, yeah, and if you look up the X, it's Y. I just left that line out. Okay. And you can see that the, the logic here is that um, it sets the annotations by looking at the annotations and defaulting to you know, an empty object. And it just splats these together. The one, the one on the outside would override the one on the inside. So one common use case for decorators is to make an observed property. So you have a, a property, but you want it to be actually an accessor with backing storage. And at first I wasn't very convinced that this was such a special pattern, but after talking to people for a while, I think uh, this is what logically makes sense to do when you're wrapping storage. When you're wrapping storage, you want to uh, make it into a getter setter with a special path to initialize it. The path to initialize is special because in practice with decorators, what's, what's been found is that the set path has to maintain sort of a Boolean about whether it's initialized to figure out whether it's the initializing set. So the idea, the, the way that tracked works is that it actually can return an initialize function that would be sort of like a distortion on what's initialized or if you pass undefined, it gets sort of nothing. And, um, So here's how it would desugar. It would desugar into, it makes a private field. This has full private field semantics, in, including how if you access it before it's uh, defined, then you get a TDZ. You know, it's not added to the object yet. And it would have the, the getter and the setter. These are sort of the, the underlying ones that are then like pulled out and replaced through this defined property call but all this is unobservable because the constructor is just not visible to the decorators. Okay, but let, let, please keep this on the screen for a while. I just want to see that for a while. I'm, I'm confused about uh, who's providing which to whom. Uh, this is the desugaring. It's the desugaring of the usage here. So here's a usage, and this would be what it compiles into. So, 
So where is the, the, the there's a, at the top, there's a let initialize, get, and set. I see where initialize yeah. is being used. So those are provided by tract. But, but tract inside the code, to inside turn an object that has those three properties. Inside the expansion of element, I'm not seeing any use of the get and set variables. Oh, it's used by this object.define property here, where they're reset as the methods. How is initialize? Oh, oh okay. I see, I mm. see. And the cool thing about this is, sure, the, the property key is passed to the decorator, but this actually works just fine for tracking private fields with just no changes, as long as you don't, don't depend, as long as you handle a case where the kind is missing. Because, uh, no, no, not the kind, the name. If you, as long as you handle the case where the name is missing, this works just fine on, uh, on private fields. So, okay, what I don't understand is why is there a counter in the desugared element at all? Uh, so this is, th the reason that this is here is just so that it can close over the private field. But you're going to replace that. being replaced. So with, with the static blocks proposal that Ron Buckton has, we wouldn't have this kind of messiness of this property that then we replace. Maybe okay. I should use that proposal in the desugaring, but I wasn't sure because using a new proposal in the desugaring could be confusing in other ways. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, I, I think this proposal would mean the same thing if you just erased the, um, those two lines from the desugaring. Correct. Uh, well, it wouldn't work because that's how we get access to the private field. But you don't need access to the private field because uh, all accesses are getting turned into uh, calls to to the get and set that you're providing. Well, we, we need to access. We need to tell. We need to pass the access of the private field into the tracked decorator. It's it's used as a parameter and then thrown away. What is the other parameter again? What is the definition of tract? Tract is defined here. Tract takes the get and set. Actually, it should return initialize. I have it not return initialize here, but imagine initialize being a new identity function. It reuses the get and it wraps the set that it gets. Where it compare for it calls get again and it checks whether get oh. will equal the value and then it calls the underlying set if needed and it calls a re-render. This is just an example. It's not intended that this is canonical in some way. No, this is tracked as an example of a decorator, and then the desugaring is kind of canonical, except the desugarings are, are rough in, in many ways. Right. So the, the point of tracked is that it will only call set if necessary, basically. Yeah. We, you know, we already have to do the comparison because we only want to do the re render if there was an actual change. Right. Instead of re-render, you could picture like dirty marking and then somebody else will come along and re-render it. Mm -hmm. Be more realistic. Uh, well, let me propose that you don't need to pass anything into tract at all. If tract simply returns a, oh, 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 I see, I see what's going on. So tract I'm not clear on, there, there are protocols where we could make that work. Like we could call get uh, sort of with the new, with the underlying value and then get would be allowed to make distortions on it. And we could call set with the uh, value that's being set and then the decorator could do distortions on it. But it gets tricky because uh, then sometimes you wanna do things like, like in this case where we call the get within the set. And you might, you might actually want to leak the get and set methods, uh, callbacks as in the next example. So what I'm not clear on, given this definition of tract, is what, what you're intending to communicate in the desugaring by the second argument to it. Uh, that's the context object. So the decorator, it's not used by this decorator, but it's passed to all decorators in case they want to use it. One okay. thing they can do with the context object is add annotations. Another thing yep. they can do is dispatch off of the kind of decorator it is. 
or use the property key or tell it it's static. I guess that, that's all. But uh, I, I feel like- No, no, I, I understand. It, it's, it's there because it's always there. Yeah, it's, it's always yeah. there, but it's easy to write decorators not thinking about the context object. So I, I really took as a goal that it should be easy to write decorators mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that was a big criticism of the stage two decorators. Mm -hmm. So uh, private fields, a common thing is you might want to grant access to a private field or method to something else. And so this private key library lets you use this uh, method, the show me method to expose a private, <coughs> a private field to this key, which then can be used as a kind of sort of capability to access it. And is that it works in a- Sorry, put, put the original code back on the screen. Yeah, that, right. Okay, I just want to stare at that. Okay, so the key is, okay. So the, the syntax tree for what we're looking at would be unmodified if key.show were wrapped in parentheses, correct? Uh, yeah, that's right. I hope okay, that's not so confusing. I think somebody else got confused by that in the past. Yeah, it's, it's not clear if, if, is this like a property lookup of show on at key or is this at yeah. of Oh, actually the parentheses show. change it because they might, uh, you know, the important thing is that key be the receiver of the show call. And I think if you put the parentheses, then it might sort of lose that. So this, this is a show lookup off of key. Yeah, yeah. And the yeah. result of that is used as the decorator? Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like syntax notwithstanding, I, I, who knows if parentheses will be valid there or not, but just this is, this is like key as a normal object, look up, do a get of show from that object. And then the result of that is your decorator. Yeah. In this proposal, we're sticking to the syntax of stage two decorators. So parentheses would be valid there. They would be your escape hatch because you can't write arbitrary expressions. However, if you want to do a method call, uh, it's important to, might be important to not have parentheses. So, uh, you know, there are other ways that we could broaden the scope of private names, but I thought this example was cool, partly because it just fell out of the other semantics that we were discussing. I was previously thinking we would have to create a kind of private name object and pass it as a parameter in the name field. But I think, um, we can do without that at first. Yeah, I remember the whole private name thing got impressively complicated. It got complicated, but we actually kind of solved it. We got agreement on, on a lot of details about it. Yeah. And I still think it would be valuable to, to pick up again, to have references like first class references to private names. But for the, for the more limited case of having a decorator to decorate a field to, to grant access to a particular thing, which I think is a, a useful particular case, you can use this pattern where, uh, you know, show takes get and set, sets its private fields to that, and then it has get and set methods that call it. And it desugars to something like this. So this is using an even worse pattern where, because we don't have static blocks, we could use a static, we could use a static uh, private field with a bunch of comma expressions in it to, <laughs> to leak the functions. So, uh, so were you, are you, does it get called, does it get called with get set and initialize? No, it just gets called with get and set and then it can return initialize. Huh. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of assuming that if you don't return an initialize function, then uh, it, the identity function will be used, but that's not present in this desugaring. So the desugaring doesn't work. Mm -hmm. What is, uh, if you go, back two blocks up. Uh, what is the definition of key? Okay, it's just an instance of private key. Got it. Right, right. Okay. So, I mean, we had, we had the discussion in this meeting about whether it's okay to allow access 
for for decorators to private fields and we came to the conclusion that it's okay as long as you're directly decorating that private element right uh, this version of the proposal sort of meets that requirement where Good. we're decorating that particular private element and uh you're just getting access to that particular thing that you're decorating. Good. So finally, this deprecated version, this decorate, deprecated decorator, uh, I want to show an example of dispatching off the kind because you know, the context argument, it's a little bit ugly that there has to be a second argument, but I really do think it's useful. For example, when you have a field and you want to deprecate it, you need to wrap the get and set things. Whereas if you have a method or getter or setter and you want to deprecate it, you just wrap the, the function. So you want to be able to dispatch over what you're, you're deprecating and throw error messages when the decorator is used in an inappropriate context. Okay. Now, a late edition uh, can you add, can you when you decorate a getter or decorator or setter, are you actually decorating the individual getter or setter rather than decorating the fields? Yeah, you're just decorating the individual getter or setter. If you decorate like a like in the first example with logs, where we decorated a setter, you're just decorating that one setter. Wow. Okay. You know there was this whole discussion around coalescing uh, with yep. the. C decorators, but I feel like coalescing is really, uh, it's mostly a thing that's necessary for when you're converting a field into a getter setter pair. And so now we're just representing that directly. Okay. So uh, now this late edition from uh, Jordan Harband was that we make it so that there's a way when you have a method and you decorate it so that there's a there's a callback that's called when the object is getting created. So it's it's as if you had an initialized callback like for fields, but for methods. And so I call these init methods. So you put this init contextual keyword here. There's an unfortunate no line terminator here, right there. And um, so it gets the method and it returns both a method and an initialized callback. So in this case, it registered the on decorator registers an event handler. Uh, and keep, 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 that, keep that on the screen, hold on. Slow, slow processing. Uh, put back on the screen the piece of code that uses the on decorator that's above this one. Okay, right, please. Yes, good. Just stay there for a while. Might want to plug in, Daniel. I don't know if you saw. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame to lose you in the middle of this. That's not inside the window. It wasn't supposed to show up. With him. What does this refer to in, in the on in the on function? I don't. I don't know if it has a receiver. Uh, was there a question? Yeah, yes. the, the question the, the question was if the um, the the it, on the on function that's on the screen refers to this. Oh, oh, oh no, 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 the, yeah, it's oh. it, it's deeper yeah, so than the that. Initialized <laughs> thing is called. Oh yeah, see, I have initialized dot call this. Okay. Okay. Because I think it's really important that the initialize function get access to the object under construction. You know, because it's it's initializing that. That comes up in the next example of usage also. Yes. So you're calling the add event listener method on in this example, this instance of my element. Yes. 
I see, I see. My element extends HTML element. You're inheriting at listener. And then on click says, please register this method of the subclass. That seems very weird that it's the object itself that's going to react to the event well, in the object. So there's that's a, kind there's of uh, a problem. Um, I'm sorry, the audio got garbled. Event listen, the event listeners are part of the the DOM object, you know, where the where the object knows how to respond to it, clicks on it. Right, that's that's for the object to be an emitter of events, but over here the object is receiving the event that it's emitted. Right, the object is the receiver of the event that's emitted. So, yeah. okay. So those in, in the DOM are not handled. They don't directly call cause method calls, but they call it, they there's this event target concepts and the object and you can listen to the events on yourself or you could also register listeners that are not part of the class this is just if you wanted to do one pattern so but the important thing here is that the fact that there is an initialization action is indicated syntactically with this init keyword if the init keyword is missing then the decorator has no right no no capability to add initialization action Okay, so I don't understand that because in the absence of the init, the decorator is receiving the original click handler as an argument and the thing that it produces is then used as the binding of the name click handler, correct? Right, right. Without the init keyword, that's all the decorator can do. But with the init keyword, its return value is interpreted as a pair of a method and the initialized method. And the initialized method is called at this particular time during construction, interspersed with field declarations. I see, I see, I see, I see. Um, because. Hmm. What is, the, what is the, the context? What are the fields of the context again? In this uh, case? The context means the kind, the name, which is the property key is static, uh, and you can add annotations to it. Okay. Okay. I don't have an alternative, but I'm, I have to say I'm having a bad reaction to the init because it's taking something that had very, very few concepts and a lot of reach for the few concepts and is adding another concept. Yeah, I, well, it also seems a bit weird uh, to me. Um, I'm, I, I would be fine with leaving init decorators for, or init methods for a follow-on proposal, but I wanna show that they work within this broader framework. So Jordan felt that it's very important to have a bound decorator and bound decorators fit into this framework as long as we have a place in the constructor to run a code snippet. Uh, Jordan considers this kind of bound decorator to be sort of one of the primary use cases of decorators. So that's why I included in it in this draft, but I'm still open to reconsidering it. I think. So I don't, don't understand. That sense. So, so uh, the goal makes sense uh, from the example in the middle of the screen. Uh, I do not understand how this example brings about that goal. So Jordan's really interested in having a bound method where you can monkey pass the class to change the method and then bound will, when the instance is created, it will reflect the previous monkey patching that's been done for a testing framework that he, that he develops. Oh, so I see. This, was, this, this idiom this. is more testable with his framework than, if, than the pattern that has become popular where you do, uh, you know, method equals, and then you just use an arrow function. Okay. 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 I, I, okay. I, I, I understand what it's doing. The problem is that 
this has the overhead of creating a bound method per method, I mean, a bound method allocation, creates an allocation per method per instance. And there, and so it's getting all the benefits of the object disclosure pattern by paying the prohibitive cost of the object disclosure pattern, uh, which is exactly the reason why people, uh, you know, why we could not get people to use the object disclosure pattern is that, is that uh, n, n times m allocation overhead. Uh, let me see. Uh, I, do not, I do not endorse this pattern. Jordan does. Okay, let me try out a different way. Let me, let me try out on you a different way to achieve bound methods with decorators that I've been thinking about and see whether this proposal would do that as well. Um, uh, the example usage in the middle of the screen with M, uh, the, the one that I have in mind would still do that. Uh, and that would be that it replaces the Prop, the data property on c.prototype.method, it would replace that data property with an accessor property uh, where the getter would uh, return the method function as bound to the this that, that the get happened on. So could, could you write a bound decorator without the init that simply replaced the, the binding of the name method on c.prototype with an accessor whose getter always returned the same method function as bound to the this pa passed into the getter? Uh, in a previous version of this document where I had instead of init methods, I had trap methods that would convert the method into a getter setter pair with a uh, with an underlying storage. I had that it would create this thing on the first use and it would cache it in the storage or maybe we could not cache it either way. Uh, anyway, Jordan didn't like this. He thought that it needed, that wasn't testable. I didn't quite understand his argument. Maybe we could include him in the next discussion to, to clarify this. Okay. But I think the on case, the on case makes sense to me, where you want to just register this thing when the class gets created. Okay. What the part that doesn't make sense to me here isn't isn't the use case. It's the it's the need for a new contextual keyword to to gain access to it. Oh, so the, the reason for that is if we didn't require a new contextual keyword then we would have to add the space for an initialization action for every decorated method. But it's a goal of this proposal that the, that the overhead of doing these extra calls for potential initialization actions only be incurred at the decorator usage sites where it's actually requested by the user. So this is, this is basically, if you take the eight goals and TypeScript goals and you put them together, it's that every shape change has to be called out in syntax, or we have to incur that shape change all the time. I can go into more detail about that, but we couldn't make it. Then why, initial, why the initialize counts as a, as a shape change? What I mean, initialize is considered a shape change because the, the JavaScript engine wants to be able to emit bytecode for creating an instance of the class before it evaluates the decorators. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so that bytecode will fall into each of the initializers. Uh, we could have it be that the bytecode would call into sort of uh, an undefined local variable that would then get filled in by the decorator. It would just do, do a function call there, but we would incur these function calls for every single decorated method. Okay. We don't want to incur the, these extra function calls if the methods are not asking for initialization actions. My, my feeling is that most methods are not asking for initialization actions. So that's why a contextual keyword is needed. I see. Yeah, this constraint that you need to generate the code for the constructor before you evaluate the decorators is an interesting constraint. This is basically the core thing that made the previous stage two decorators 
decorators invalid, uh, like unacceptable for V8. And the static decorators was one attempt to solve it. This is another attempt to solve it by saying that decorators always do just one, just one particular thing. Okay. Hmm. Okay. I don't, I don't have anything more to add on that right now, but I, it, it does feel like like that's the um, that's the weakest aspect of what we're looking at. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would personally, I would be happy to leave this for a follow on proposal for, you know, future consideration. I don't see, I don't think it needs to be in the decorator MVP, but, uh, yeah, we have this sort of contradiction among goals where TypeScript wants decorators to be transpilable in a single file context. V8 wants the shape of the class to be statically determinable, though it's okay with car cross-file dependencies for that. And Jordan wants this very specific bound method pattern to be expressible in a decorator. So that's a request that he's making. So if we if we look at the um, at the desugared version, the I guess it's not even there. Of the desugared of on maybe. Um, yeah this is so the desugared of on. I didn't write the, it down because it would be the same. So V8, having established the shape of a of a class based on based on syntax, for instantiation, the constructor is still going to run, and the constructor itself can do the very same things that we're talking about um, decorator initialization wanting to do. Like by definition, we're looking at we're looking at it right here in the desugaring. Yeah, that, so, that's right. So we could do an extra function call on every single method that's decorated in the initializer for the class. That would be kind of a uh, unfortunate because another one of the its constraints is that there should not be runtime overhead incurred for the parts of decorators that you're not trying to use. And my, my analysis is that most use cases for method decorators are not trying to add these initialization actions. So we would be necessarily in the in the baseline interpreter case, incurring these extra checks or calls to see just in case the decorator had provided an initialized callback when it when it mostly hasn't. So the decorator runs. Okay, it wouldn't, but it wouldn't be running in the constructor, in for the common cases. So what? Uh, or right, no, it would be. Yeah, the decorator. Okay. All right. The Most, mostly they're, they'd be modifying the prototype. Okay. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the decorator wouldn't run in the constructor in the common case. And then it's right. rare cases where it does run. But if you disagree with that, then that would be like a reason to consider changes to the design. No, no, I, I think that's actually correct. It, it'd be, it, it would be a rare case that the decorator needs to do something at construction because a good decorator is instead just going to mutate the prototype. Um, well, even mutate, it's just wrapping the, the, the method before it gets onto anything. And just you're well, uh, mutate in the sense of the prototype looks different based on presence or absence of the decorator. Right, right, right. But the constructor yes. method, the constructor does not look different for most decorators. Uh, based on presence or absence. It's, it's the rare ones that would change code to run at construction time. Right, exactly. So that's the motivation for the init contextual keyword, which I agree is unfortunate. So I guess we're, we're over time. Like I can keep going, but uh, maybe, but this really just gets into details that I've actually been describing. Here I say like, look, the ID decorator is not the ID decorator because it changes the semantics of fields as being backed by a private field, which is totally observable. And that's just something that we're buying into because we're saying when you wrap something, that's this is how you reify it and it has these these observable effects. So, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna move on to another section really quickly. What were you gonna say? Uh, I would just the, the, uh, the, the decorator that I've always wanted to write back when we had a live decorator proposal, and again, that I would want to write this one, is defensive classes. 
Um, I've always been shy about proposing defensive classes as a language construct because if we're going to have adequately expressive decorators, I would rather provide them as a, li as a decorator library. Um, but uh, so defensive classes are also a little bit difficult. So you could you could make a class decorator that freezes the prototype, but if you make a class decorator that freezes the constructor, it won't really work because the static fields are evaluated after the class decorator is evaluated. This was decided at the 2016, uh, I think May Munich TC39 meeting. That's all we already are seeing sort of the fallout of that in because the static field initializers can see the class. So the class is already out of TDZ there. And so defensive classes become difficult with that decision that we made in 2016. Uh, but it I should thought be there, was, there was a recent discussion about uh, the class name being bound inside the class versus the class name being bound outside the class. Uh, well, I'm not changing, it's not changing that. So we could make a second callback, but right now in this proposal, the class decorator callback, it's called before the static fields are added. You know, in the stage two decorators proposal, there were several different callbacks. There were all these different stages and this was very confusing to people. There were all these sort of finalizers or whatever they were called finishers. And people found all these different callbacks really confusing. So this proposal collapses it into there's just one time the decorators run. And, and what is that time? Uh, the time is sort of during class evaluation. And I guess different decorators run at different times. You know, the fields, the fields and methods run and, and the class decorator runs and then the static fields are evaluated, which includes evaluating those static field decorators. So we could, we could somehow add a callback that you could register in the class decorator to freeze the constructor, but I think that would add a lot of complexity to the proposal. But I, I also feel like the most important part of defensive classes is the prototype being frozen and the instances being frozen. And the instances can be frozen, uh, well, if you make them all decorated, then freezing the instance doesn't mean much and you can freeze it kind of early on. That could be done even in an init method. Um, but I, I kind of feel like we should do defensive classes a little bit differently, like related to typed objects. I think there are more invariants that we could get at with sort of redesigning a little bit more than just with decorators. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to, to make defensive classes a language proposal. Um, I wanted to, to, you know, I was hoping that it could be a library using decorators, but, but if not, it can be a language proposal. So personally, I've been thinking about typed classes and typed objects, and I wonder if those could be just sort of defensible by default, largely. I think being typed and being defensible kind of correspond to each other um, some ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, also this would allow function uh, decorations and annotations. Uh, but if, if you decorate or annotate a function, it's no longer able to be hoisted because code has to execute for the function declaration to evaluate. Ah, so good. it would just be in, it would be like a class. It would be in TDZ until you reach that. Okay. And I understand that that's kind of a problem for use in existing code, but at least it would be a clean error that you would get. Yeah. Then yeah. Parameter, parameter decorators, you could have um, a parameter decorator fundamentally, it returns a function that... Uh, goes from the argument and returns a new value of the argument. And it could actually be called with the this value if it's a method of the enclosing thing. Uh, and it could also, they can also add annotations. Okay, so in particular, you could have a uh, input validation uh, check, like um, uh, if, the, if, this if the argument that would be bound to this parameter is not posi a positive number throw. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, or casting, you could also do casting through this. Yeah. But it doesn't tell you like the number of the parameter. It just tells you that it's a parameter and um, yeah, that's all. And it just lets you put annotations on and it will apply to the right parameter. So I think 
TypeScript parameter decorators were kind of more complicated where you would get the parameter index and then you'd be responsible for wrapping the whole function based on that. And that, that to me always seemed kind of like a layering violation or something. Okay. Yeah, uh, Waldemar and I had a uh, guards proposal a very, very, very long time ago, which kind of used a TypeScript-like annotation in the parameter list uh, to invoke a function uh, between the argument and binding the parameter variable uh, that could that could do um, input validation or testing. Well, oh, if you have any uh, reference, to that, yeah, I'd love to read it. Yeah, I've got the, uh, it's on the old ECMAScript wiki that's up on archive.org. I can find it. In this case, it's actually really close to a value decorator. Just arbitrary, you know, function that um, one input, one output. Yeah, that's that's kind of further down here. But before value decorators, here's sort of the craziest one. You could have a let decorator, where when you decorate a mutable variable, it converts it into a getter setter pair, uh, yeah. just like fields. And when they, then when you write to the variable, it uh, will call the, the setter. So the reason that this might be okay is that it's very statically analyzable. When you see a decorated let, you know that it's that. It can't leak out of sloppy mode eval or anything like that. But it, it is kind of, it is kind of crazy, but I think I thought it might be useful for stuff like React hooks, where they want to, um, where they use these local set functions to have yeah, better was, syntax. Yeah, this was also a component of our guards proposal, uh, is that you could have a guarded let variable uh, where the guard would, would do input validation on any assignment to the variable. So, uh, I'm really, I'm really interested in this guard proposal. I kind of feel like there's two concepts to pursue, maybe separately. One is a, one is a uh, trap that works on reads and writes and is allowed to transform the value, and the other is a guard, where you're only checking a property of the value, and your choices are to throw or not or not throw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see that kind of category distinction. So there's there's a third one which is like your second. But in the not throw case, it could return a different value. So it would be a, a validating coercer rather than just a validator. Oh, so it's like in between. It, it, it's allowed to cast, but it's not allowed to intercept the get. That's correct. That's correct. And that way, the thing is variables are read tremendously more often than they're written. So if you can intervene only on the assignment and the initialization, and by the way, you should have a separate initialize, just like you have for fields. But if you, can initial, if you can intervene only on the initialization and assignment uh, and leave the reads unmodified, uh, you can leave the performance of code using this uh, uh, pretty high. Yeah, that's a good point. So then I thought const decorators, they would be just wrapping the initialization and object decorators similar, but we could also decorate object properties and object methods as well. I think they would all just fit into a common framework. And yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the proposal. I have more about the motivation here. But uh, you think, I was thinking that if, if this seems reasonable, then we would go into like a six month, uh, you know, prototyping period to validate it. And maybe after that, propose advancement. Is this, does this seem like a reasonable direction to all of you? Yes, uh, I think it's worth investigating. Um, I'm, you know, I, I have, I'm sort of torn in the normal way of being torn on these things, which is on the one hand, uh, there's all sorts of enablers for my favorite features that I would like to have in there. But on the other hand, I would also think, I'm, I'm also reacting, God, I wish it were simpler than this. So, so um, you know, it's, it's, it's the, you know, the normal tension. All right, I'm going <clears> to <throat> stop recording.